Greater Lebanon was established in September 1920 in a post-war redrawing of Middle Eastern borders. Historians often locate the sort of problematic origins, if you will, to Lebanon's political system at various points. Some of them will point to 1920 and the construction of Greater Lebanon being carved in a particular way out of Syria. There were people who went to bed one day thinking they were Syrians or Ottomans, and the next day they woke up to find themselves in a Lebanese state. They asked, what was this? A Lebanese state? We don't want this. United on the surface, deep divisions rumbled below. Crowds in the streets of Beirut seem to be borne on a wave of cheerful enthusiasm which contrasts oddly with the reports of riots and unrest in the Lebanese capital. In 1943, the Lebanese were convinced that they could be now an independent nation. Uh, this is behind or this is the reason why uh, uh, they protest against the French mandate uh, in the streets. Following the dispute that arose between the Lebanon government and the French Committee of National Liberation in Algiers, the streets were deserted around the Lebanese parliament buildings closed by order of the fighting French authorities. A strong guard of French colonial troops was posted outside to quell possible disturbances. Following the decree which made General de Gaulle the sole political head of the fighting French Empire, the Lebanon president and his government found themselves popped in jail. What happened in 1943 was that compromise where the, uh, the Maronites accepted, you know, uh, the, Christian, the Muslims as partners and uh, that, that they will have also power, especially the Sunnis. And uh, the Sunnis, especially the, the factions that were asking for uh, that Syria, Lebanon, going back to the idea of Syria and Lebanon, they accepted to follow the Riyad Salah and this wave, this movement that agreed to put, uh, to shake the hand of the Christians and to make a partnership. The post-independence years brought signs of promise. In 1953, my father was uh, he was ambassador and he was called in 1952 to become minister. In 1953, he wrote the first anti-corruption law. 1953. I remember at the beginning of 1953, he activated the law with his uh, government and the parliament of that time. They issued the law to give women the right to vote and be elected. 1960s as a decade in Lebanese history is most often discussed or most famous for being termed the golden age of Lebanese history. Besides people coming from the from the West, you had people coming from all over the Arab world, you know, from Iraq, from Jordan, from Syria, from Palestine, meeting in these cafes, having living here, feeling feeling free. The other side of the 1960s is not just Hollywood actors and Baalbek festivals, but includes guerrilla training in different parts of, in rural parts of the country. Lebanon was also suffering the aftershocks of Israel's creation, which sent some 100,000 Palestinian refugees over the border. In 1968, Israeli commandos attacked Beirut airport after an initial attack on an Israeli plane by a Lebanon-based Palestinian group. Lebanon's brewing troubles were also reflected in its art. In our activity as artists, as, uh, you know, theater makers, all our plays were pointing to a, a catastrophe. We felt that it was coming, the war. So it's important to understand that for every time that we talk about Lebanon's golden age of the 1960s, there are the rumblings underground of what would ultimately be the social and economic inequalities which would provide very fertile soil for the conflict in the 1970s, for the Lebanese Civil War in other words. Civil war began in 1975, initially between Christian militias and Palestinian groups and their Lebanese allies. The United States, Russia and Syria were drawn in. Israel invaded twice and occupied Beirut in 1982. 
Hundreds of thousands of people were uprooted. The guns fell silent in 1990, with some 150,000 dead. Why did this war happen? What happened? How are we going to start again? We don't know. We had this man coming from Saudi with, uh, to, to Syria, to Lebanon, and rebuilding Lebanon, using the same people, the same warlords, the same, uh, but they changed their costumes. In the post-war period, Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri took the lead in Beirut's reconstruction. Throughout 15 years of civil war, Beirut conjured up images of destruction. The center of the city, the front line where Christian fought Muslim, was reduced to rubble. Now, three years after the war ended, Lebanon is about to start rebuilding the devastated center. It's billed as the world's biggest urban redevelopment project of the 1990s. What happened is that they imposed the amnesia on us. I would say that. It's an imposed amnesia. They meant it, and uh, Prime Minister Hariri was one of those who uh, advanced this idea. Let's not keep remembering. Let's forget and move. Old fault lines persisted, and new ones emerged. Sunni and Shiite Muslims fell out following the 2005 assassination of Hariri. The last 15 years have been punctuated by political slayings, a war between Hezbollah and Israel, and a brush with civil conflict in 2008. You know, you live between a war and another, and you rebuild, and then you, everything is destroyed, and then you rebuild again. It's not fun. It's not fun, that's why I lost hope. On August 4th, Beirut suffered its latest ordeal, when a port explosion killed some 180 people, injured 6,000, and destroyed a swathe of the city. It triggered new reflection on Lebanon's troubled past and concerns for the future.